relationship work to the natural world? Because essentially, uh, we see ourselves, humankind, as separate and superior to the rest of the world. Things are starting to change a bit now, but you know, that's, that has been the case for a long time. We are the master race. We are homo sapiens. We can do, we can do what we want uh, with the rest of the planet. We'll take what we want and we'll you know, turn it into waste. Uh, 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 and that's how it is. Um, and our language reflects the fact we talk about resources, water resources, you know, whatever it is. They're for us to use as we see fit. Uh, we talk about fish stocks. They're there. That's what they're there for. They're, they're for human consumption. And when they're, when they're exhausted, well, we'll come on something else or whatever we're going to do. But they're for us. Uh, we talk about... Uh, you know, we have reserves, game reserves, you know, all of they're, they're, they're for, for humans. Uh, and this worldview is, is said to be anthropocentric, you know, or human, human centric. But the reality is that what's going on is, as you can see from some of these little graphs, you know, we're taking more and more from, from the planet. You know, everything's going up in terms of consumption. Uh, rivers are being dammed. Rivers Many rivers are no longer able to reach the sea because they're all jammed up. We're making more stuff. It's all about making more, making more money. They're all the drivers there. Look at the number of you see. It's got McDonald's restaurants there. You know, um, this, these are just illustrative, of course. And what is happening is that the natural world is suffering massively. And there's, you can see at the bottom right, where it's got species. This, this is species extinction. So this is going up at a huge rate, and we're now going for the full, uh, uh, the, uh, a, mass, uh, a mass extinction. Mass extinction, that's what we're going for. So we are causing real harm to the world through what we've been doing. But the wild law model is all about interaction uh, with, with the natural world. There's nothing special about man. Man is completely dependent upon the natural world. He's not going to last for five minutes without oxygen. You know, he needs trees for the oxygen. So there are all these interactions going on. We're part of the natural world. We're just one species out of millions. Uh, and we've got, a, we've got a respect to look after it. Because if we don't, you know, we're, going to be, we're going to be chucked off. You know, things are going to become very uncomfortable for us. So that's the model. That's the reality. That's, that is the universe. And we've just got to realize that that is the case. And, and work with it, and have laws that work with it. But at the moment, our laws don't recognise that, or very, very few of them do. But I want now to see how things have started to change. And I mean, we could go back further than this, but I think a good starting point is an essay that was written in 1972 by an academic in the, in the United States called Christopher Stone. Uh, and it's now a book that you can buy. It's a collection of essays. It's called Should Trees have standing. At the same time as he was writing this, he was aware that there was a big issue going on uh, to do with a, a valley in California called the Mineral King Valley. And it's, it's surrounded by the Sequoia uh, National Park, but it was, it was mined to, to a limited extent in the kind of gold rush era, sort of 1870s, 1880s, not to get gold out, but to get silver out, and that gives it its name. Uh, Mineral King Valley. It wasn't part of the Sequoia uh, National Park. And somebody, and here's a picture of it, so it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful place. And somebody, well in fact the, the National Parks Association were keen to get the place developed, get jobs, you know, get the economy growing. Uh, and they encouraged people to kind of come forward. And eventually Walt Disney came, came, came forward and they said, hey, we'd love to develop this valley, Mineral King Valley, uh, into, a, into a fantastic ski resort, which could take up to 14,000 people a day. It'd be full of chairlifts, restaurants, motels, swimming pools, multi-story car parks, etc., etc. And, you know, and the US Forest Service was delighted about this and, and granted planning permission. But the Sierra Club, which at the time still is, you know, the most powerful environmental uh, Association in the US didn't like that, surprisingly, the environmental uh, group, uh, and they brought an injunction to stop this development from happening at all. They wanted to keep it in its natural state. I mean, you know, they had enough of Disney places elsewhere, 
Florida accept, but they wanted to keep the valley uh, in their eyes unspoiled. But the key issue was whether the Sierra Club had standing. Now, standing is a, is a legal concept, and basically it means that to go to court, you have to have a sufficient connection to, to, the, to the matter, either that, you know, for example, uh, if you own a property, um, if you own a property in the valley, that would be sufficient, or maybe if you used to um, go there regularly, or if you had some employment there, then you would have standing, because you had that strong connection. But the trouble was, uh, did the Sierra Club have standing? Because they didn't own any property within the valley or anything like that. Um, and, and so this went all the way up to the highest court in the land in the US, the US Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court held that Sierra Club lacked this vital issue of standing, so they couldn't go to court. If you don't have standing, you're not even going to get, you know, you're not even going to get heard by, by the courts. So that, that was critical. So that doesn't sound good. However, what had happened, um, one of the Supreme Court judges, whose name was William O. Douglas, and he in fact was and still is, I mean he's not, he's, he, he, well he's dead now, but um, at, he, he, his record's never been beaten. He's, he's the longest serving US Supreme Court, um, member of the US Supreme Court in history, he's there for 35 years, and nobody's equal to that. So this is a hugely senior, important US judge. He read Christopher Stone's Should Trees Have Standing. He read that essay, and it really resonated with him. And not surprisingly, he spent a lot of his time in, in the outdoors, you know, and doing big, big trails, Appalachian Trail and things like that. And so it, it strongly resonated with him. So his judgment didn't agree with the majority. However, there is a very happy ending, please say, to all of this. Uh, they may not have won in court on that point, but they, they, they actually won the war because there was another judge who basically said, OK, Sierra Club, you don't have standing in your own right, but all you need to do is find one or two members who do because they've got a close interest, a close connection with the valley, and then basically you can just back them so they can come as individuals and you can provide all of your backing behind that. And that's been replicated in many cases uh, since, since then. Uh, and, and so basically, it was sort of um, the, the, the court was saying, you can get, get it right, and then you can come back and start again. Uh, and then Disney realized it was facing, you could be facing very, very long, expensive litigation and abandoned the idea. So they, they walked away from it. And then eventually, a few years later, uh, the valley was made part of the Sequoia National Park and it's protected. So it's, you know, it's a nice story because somebody stuck his neck out and it had a, had a great result. But looking at the development of, of wild law since the Sierra Club case, just taking the, com the key things here, of course, but one of the, one of the books that everybody's interested in the jurisprudence should, should really read is the great work by Father Thomas Berry. Uh, he's had a profound you know, uh, influence on, on, you know, on wild law and, and the whole subject of, of uh, jurisprudence. Um, he wanted to, to bring us back into nature, so we understand nature. We, we spend time in nature, and if we spend all of our time in offices, never go out, we're not going to understand it. So he wanted, he thought it was important for humans to be out in nature, respecting nature, and that we're, we're working with the natural world as opposed to, well, as opposed to against it. Very important text, work. Uh, and that was picked up by Cormac Cullinan, who wrote the book Wild Law? Cormac is saying is, following on from Thomas Berry and agreeing with everything that Thomas Berry said, but he was a, Cormac is a lawyer, so he was looking at the legal system, and he said the problem is our governance systems, our, our, our legal systems, are not in tune with, with nature at, at all. Uh, and even if you don't fully uh, agree with the whole kind of wild law concept, right? rights of nature. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of other things that I think at least can take you quite a long way down the road. And the one that I think I put up here, although I don't think it really takes us very far at all, is that of sustainability because it's so overused and can mean almost anything you want. You know, sustainability can mean you know sustainable economic growth. So politicians use it, as you know, all the time. 
um, and it's probably been massively diluted from what its original intention was. So we sort of leave sustainability aside, but of course it does. That takes us on to kind of intergenerational equity, which is the kind of the original thing behind the Brundtland Commission and those kind of thoughts. You know, um, we're not going to ever exploit uh, for, for for now, so that we still got something for future generations. And this is the whole thing about intergenerational equity. Surely we want to leave the planet in a state which is at least habitable for future generations. And by future generations, you know, how far how far do we go? Do we just look at our kind of grandchildren, our great grandchildren? Um, so that's one thing. Then we've got rights as cetaceans, you know, dolphins, uh, whales, killer whales, those sorts of things, and great apes. These are hugely intelligent creatures. Arguably, dolphins may be more <laughs> smarter than us even. Chimpanzees, of course, our closest living uh, species relative. And if you look at the genes of the chimpanzee compared to us, the only difference is they've got one extra gene. Other than that, we're you know pretty much identical. We are you know, genetically. There are, there are places covered. So, and it's only six six million years ago that we split from them under the you know the tree of life. There are nearest relatives. Surely they should have rights very similar to humans. Now, Polly's big campaign is really on eco side because what she's saying is it's, it's it's all very well talking about rights right to nature and animals. Um, but you need, you need, you need uh, some force behind that. And you, essentially, you need people to be accountable. And she's taken that, she's suggesting that it's having a lot of, it's a lot of success um, in her discussions with the United Nations that there would be a new crime of ecocide, just like there's a crime of genocide. If you commit ecocide, uh, then you, know, you should be taken to task. You should be um, you know, um, tried. Go to, go to prison for that because there's often uh, a lack of accountability with all this. You know, people will talk and say, okay, we'll, we'll behave ourselves. If you don't, uh, then you should be accountable. Polly did, which was great. Um, she got top QCs in the country, there's a guy called uh, Michael Mansfield, to have a, a mock trial. Uh, on the basis of the Gulf, it was really based, they didn't actually call it the Gulf Oil Spill, but it, the BP, it's really based, all the facts are based around that. So um, taking the, you know, the, the BP chairman to court, saying you're responsible for all of this, you caused ecocide, your company, which you, you, you know, ultimately you control, you caused all this.